First, you draw a circle, then you dot the eyes, add a great big smile, and presto! It's Kirby, the super tough pink puff. This pink menace has been going strong for over three decades. Although Kirby is owned by Nintendo, the games are developed by HAL Laboratory, who is essentially a second-party developer. With a vast amount of video games comes a vast number of stories. Wait, Kirby has story? It's a question you might have heard of whether the one asking is trolling or not. That question or any paraphrased version of it can lead to uncivil story discussions that no other Nintendo franchise endures. I'll be going over story elements in the Kirby series because there's so much discourse and misconceptions in the community that needs to be addressed. Kirby's storytelling is heavily influenced by the internet by both the developers and its fans. Because of that, you'll be seeing social media posts in this video. Since these posts are public for everyone to see, normally I wouldn't censor usernames, but because a long-term viewer and friend of mine knew I was making this video, they requested me to censor them. So I'll be hiding identities this one time. Regardless if I were to censor them or not, do not go out of your way and harass these individuals, because at the end of the day, we're just talking about video games. Now let's use this social media post as a baseline for this video. The Kirby series doesn't have deep lore, you're just looking too deeply into things, scream individuals, who, ironically, haven't played any of the games people really just find it that hard to believe that the little pink puffball game has lore and won't educate themselves. This video will be divided into three sections. Surface Ripples will be about some of the game's plots and familiar characters. Shallow Streams will be about Kirby's obscurity and canonicity. And ending it with Deep Waters, where we'll be going in a deep. All Kirby games are on the table, meaning this is your one and only warning for spoilers for the plots, so flee while you still can. Speaking of games, I'll be referring to the video games when it comes to Kirby storytelling. There are other forms of Kirby media that will get brought up in the future, but the focus here is where it all began, the video games. As someone who's been a Kirby enjoyer for many years, I don't find it crazy when somebody questions if Kirby has a story or says something along those lines. The answer is yes. Events do happen in these series. However, the issue is how nuanced that yes is. When it comes to creative narratives in Kirby, HAL Labs gets heavily overestimated by its loyal fanbase. Just to be clear, when I say fanbase, I don't mean everyone. So for argument's sake, and for this video, let's call this group the Loud Kirby Fans. Most Kirby plots are fairly cookie-cutter that uses the Kirby's Adventure formula. Game usually starts with Kirby eating, sleeping, or minding his own business. A local or extraterrestrial force is threatening Popstar. Kirby goes out to stop it, Nothing eventful happens until the 11th hour where you fight the penultimate boss, only for the final boss to reveal themselves in the end. A series that relies on the power of friendship. Peace is restored and the game is over. Now, it wouldn't be completely fair to move on to my next point without elaborating more on this current point about plots, so let me pick five different games. Yep, these will do. If there's a game you expected to see here, don't worry, because at some point in the video, it'll get brought up. When there's Kirby lore discussion, three games are usually brought up in a matching set. Kirby's Dream Land 2, Kirby's Dream Land 3, and Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards. The Kirby community calls it the Dark Matter Trilogy. Key note on community. Because I've never seen these three games ever get called a trilogy by Nintendo or HAL Laboratory. And if they ever did, please let me know. In Kirby's Dreamland 2, Kirby lives in the Rainbow Islands of Dreamland. The rainbow that connects the islands have been stolen by the evil Dark Matter. Dark Matter has taken control of Kindidi and wants to turn Dreamland into a dark world. Dark Matter fits the bill for the basic evil dark energy villain with zero personality. The reason it attacked Dreamland was because it had no friends and was lonely. With the help of three animal friends, Kirby sets out on his latest quest to save Dreamland. After collecting all the collectibles and putting possessed DDD in the dirt, Dark Matter reveals its true form for one final fight. Combining the power of your collectibles, Kirby now has a sword gun and shoots Dark Matter in the face. Or I guess, I. Blowing it up for good. Congratulations, Kirby! The day is safe. 
In Kirby's Dreamland 3, Kirby our hero makes his home in Dreamland, which is located on planet Popstar. Popstar is a small, peaceful planet at the edge of a vast universe. One day, Kirby and Gooey went fishing. Birds were singing, the sun was shining. It was such a nice day that they felt more like napping than fishing. Wait, who's Gooey? Well, Gooey is Kirby's good friend! While he's made from the same stuff as Dark Matter, he doesn't have an evil spirit. Wait, Dark Matter? Didn't Kirby kill that thing in the last game? As Kirby and Gooey relax, they notice a black, cloud-like object appear in the pop star sky. The black object started to spit out small clouds. These clouds are scattered everywhere. Just then, Koo appeared, looking panicked. Hurry, Kirby, he said. Popstar's in big trouble! The small clouds took control of King Dedede and his minions. They started to do terrible things by making you 100% this game! Now Kirby and his friends have left to get rid of those strange clouds and save planet Popstar. After collecting all the collectibles across Popstar in that terrible campaign and putting possessed DDD in the dirt, Dark Matter reveals its true form for one final fight. Combining the power of your collectibles, Kirby now has a stick gun and shoots Dark Matter in the face! Or, I guess I, DESTROYING HIM! Hey, wait a second, didn't this just happen last game? Now, another foe appears. Zero. And that eyeball gets blown up too. Congratulations, Kirby. The day is saved. It's really weird that Kirby didn't use the rainbow sword. Did he forget it at home or something? In Kirby 64, a planet far away known as Ripple Star, inhabited by fairy-like beings, gets invaded by an extraterrestrial being. And you wouldn't guess who that invader is! That's right! Dark Matter! The young fairy ribbon escapes Ripple Star with a fairy crystal and makes a break for it into space of Dark Matter hot on her heels. Dark Matter breaks the crystal and Ribbon makes a crash landing right onto Kirby's head on Planet Popstar, where the two decide to team up to find the remaining shards throughout the galaxy. Yup, the galaxy! Because apparently the rest of the crystal shards landed on a couple of other planets, including Ripple Star, the farthest one where Ribbon was escaping from. Anywho, since Dark Matter is attacking, Kirby must rally up his animal friends once again to stop this terrible cra- Hey, wait a minute. Those aren't the animal friends! Did they miss the bus or something? Or did they get tired of fighting the same villain for the third time? Some friends they turn out to be. Kirby gets a new squad. Waddle Dee, Adeline, and Kin DDD. After collecting all the collectibles and putting possessed DDD, Adeline, and Waddle Dee in the dirt, Dark Matter reveals its true form for one final fight. Except, it's not called Dark Matter, its name is Miracle Matter now. After freeing the nameless Queen of Ripple Star from Miracle Matter's control, a new foe appears! Zero! Squared! Guys, I'm starting to think Kirby's good ending actions in the other two games of this Dark Matter trilogy don't mean Jack Diddly Squat. Kirby now has a crystal handgun and shoots Zero squared in the eye socket, thus destroying it and getting blown up in a vacuum of space. Congratulations, Kirby! The day is saved. The exact same thing happened three times. From a storytelling standpoint, if you've played one game, you've played them all. Sure, each of those three games introduced new characters to the Kirby franchise, but Kirby 64 was content enough to glance over them because they weren't that important. Even previous weapons such as the Rainbow Sword and the Love Love Stick were never needed to fight back against Dark Matter's return in the following games. Which makes Kirby 64's final moments a little weird. When Waddle Dee, Adeline, and DDD were possessed, Kirby didn't need any crystal shards to snap them out of it. In the good ending of Kirby 64, collecting all the crystal shards will shoot a Kamehameha wave at the Queen, expelling Dark Matter, I mean Miracle Matter. So why in the bad ending of Kirby 64, if you fail to collect all the crystal shards, the unnamed Queen is still under Dark Ma- I mean Miracle Matter's grasp? What's stopping Kirby and friends from beating her ass? It worked the last five times! From Kirby and Ribbon's point of view, they never saw Waddle Dee and Adeline get corrupted, yet they were ready to throw hands. Well, um, Meta, um, maybe Dark Matter was trying to be low-key and sneaky about it, being a strategist and all. Ah yes, the same Dark Matter who just shrouds everyone into darkness because he has no friends. What a tactician. Anyone who is under Dark Matter's control starts acting strangely. You would think Ribbon would catch on to that immediately from her queen.
Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. High above the skies of Dreamland, the mirror world needs hope. A shadowy figure is unleashing chaos on a peaceful world. Meta Knight flies into the mirror world to protect Dreamland. I guess Kirby is on his way there as well, when he gets jumped and slashed by Meta Knight, cutting Kirby into four separate Kirbys. Sure, man. The Kirbys fly after the knight on the Warp Star, and give chase into the Mirror Dimension. Turns out, the Meta Knight who confronted Kirby wasn't the real one, because now there's two of them! Dark Meta Knight wins the Ditto matchup and launches Meta Knight into the Mirror Dimension. Wait, aren't we already in the Mirror Dimension? Dark Meta Knight shatters the Mirror Dimension too, I guess, into eight Mirror Shards, and flees with a Shadow Kirby following behind. After collecting the Mirror Shards and restoring the Mirror Dimension 2, the Kirby 4s defeat Dark Meta Knight and the floating eyeball Dark Mind and shatters his dreams for good. Now at last, peace will return to the Mirror World, but they remain on guard. After all, who knows when another evil might arise? Don't worry though, Mirror World Kirby, aka Shadow Kirby, will be there to keep them all safe. I'm sure glad we can count on him. So where do those three other Kirby's go? Next up to bat is the internet's favorite Kirby game, Kirby Squeak Squad. Kirby's about to devour his scrumptious strawberry shortcake, but then it gets stolen. Kindidity must have done it, and makes his way to Kindidity's castle to put him in the dirt. But Dedede got something stolen from him as well. That's when the Squeak Squad appear. They were the culprits who stole everything. Kirby then proceeds to go on a wild goose chase while collecting treasure on his own along the way. When Kirby defeats the Squeak Squad leader, DeRoach, Meta Knight swoops in and steals the chest. Meta Knight must have the cake, so Kirby chases after him and puts Meta Knight in the dirt as well. DeRoach steals the chest again, and opens it this time. Uh-oh! There's a dark presence inside of it, and he gets possessed. Kirby pummels the darkness out of the roach, and then defeats the dark nebula. The day is saved, and Kirby eventually gets his cake back. The loud Kirby fans are too thrilled about this game when it gets talked about because it brings misconceptions to the Kirby franchise because of the funny, haha, Kirby murdered millions and gods for a slice of cake. Let's keep that in the back of our minds for now because it's time to talk about some familiar faces in the Kirby series. Waddle Dees, a species that lives in Dreamland on Planet Popstar. Oh, oh wait, my bad. I guess they inhabit other planets as well. A anyways, these Waddle Dees all work under one dude, Kin DDD. But they also don't work for Kin DDD. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, Waddle Dee has a trophy dedicated to it with a surprising description that goes along with it. Many delicate creatures like this one inhabit Dreamland. They generally live carefree lives and have never considered themselves to be followers of King DDD. Just to inform the audience in case you didn't know, the creator of the Kirby IP is a Super Smash Bros. creator, Masahiro Sakurai. It's odd for Sakurai to say they've never considered themselves to be DDD's followers when we've seen plenty of Waddle Dees on his side. In Kirby Triple Deluxe, DDD gets possessed by Taranza. While Kirby is the only person on Popstar trying to save him, you have Waddle Dees trying to drop trees on Kirby's head. What's wrong with you? Do you not want your king to be rescued? Aww, look at the Waddle Dees in their cute little house. Wait, wait, Kirby, stop! Kirby, what are you doing? They're homeless! You know what, guys? Maybe the Nintendo fans online were right all along. Kirby is a monster who kills for food and perhaps for fun, too. Even when Planet Popstar is being invaded by aliens with advanced mechanical technology, you'll have Waddle Dees joining the win inside, using their machinery and attacking Kirby? These peaceful residents sure are violent, huh? Then you have Kirby in the Forgotten Land, where the Waddle Dees decide to help Kirby this time, after getting rescued from the Beast Pack. I guess Kirby will never know if a Waddle Dee is a good or bad guy until they start attacking, or try forcing him to play awful gyro minigames. I don't think anyone will notice if this Waddle Dee goes missing in town. <laughs> Among all the Waddle Dees, there's one who sticks out above the rest. Bandana Waddle Dee. First appearance in Kirby Superstar in a sub-game, and as an antagonist working under King DDD in Revenge of the King. After those events, they got close. And Bandana D is an ally of Kirby now. It seems how Labs just needed a player for a character because that came out of nowhere with no establishment whatsoever. But Meta, it didn't come out of nowhere. You see? Bandana Waddle Dee is the same Waddle Dee from Crystal Shards on the Nintendo 64! Oh right, there was a Waddle Dee in the 64 party who did help. Nobody knows if those two are the same character, because HAL Labs refuses to confirm it. Pack it up guys, it's canon now. 
Bandana is the same Waddle Dee. The Waddle Dee in 64 never had a bandana on. In a Kirby Star Allies trailer for the free DLC update of Adeline and Ribbon, the 64 squad is together with Bandana Waddle Dee. But on one of the celebration pictures in Star Allies, the Waddle Dee there does not have a bandana. What makes it even more confusing is on the title screen of Star Allies, you will have animations that play with certain characters, and you see the 64 squad with a parasol Waddle Dee, even though Bandana Waddle Dee is in the base game. That actually makes sense. Otherwise, they would just use the regular parasol Waddle Dee. That sure is confusing, Hal Laboratory. But hey, let's cut them some slack this one time. I'm sure this form of confusion won't happen again, right? Let's talk about some more familiar mainstay faces in the Kirby series. The villainous Kin Dedede and Meta Knight. Huh? Who's outside my house? I'll slice you into a thousand pieces as you watch with horror. You will know true pain before I finally allow you to die! Yeah... The loud Kirby fans don't like it very much when you call these two characters villains. Many would say this is a misconception of the series. A lot of loud fans believe this misconception stems from the average Nintendo fan never playing any Kirby games aside from maybe Superstar and watching that dreaded, darned anime, Kirby right back at ya! In the anime continuity, Kin DDD was the villain ordering monsters from NME to clobber that there Kirby. Meta Knight worked under the king, but his true intentions was to protect Dreamland from NME. You'll anger a lot of people if they ever catch you giving DDD his southern anime accent, or if you ever reference the word Poyo in any way, because you're clearly anime weave trash who does not understand the depth of this series. From now on, anybody in this here kingdom who says the word Poyo is gonna be found guilty of treason! Some Kirby fans over the years have complained that the anime made non-fans think Day 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 was much more villainous than he is in the games but personally my dumb complaint along those lines is that the anime made people think Kirby's catchphrase is Poyo instead of Hi. I wonder how wild it would be when many people will play Kirby game for the first time to find out that Kirby doesn't say Poyo. Day 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 is a good guy and Kirby's friend, Meta Knight is an unhinged dork and not an edgelord and Bandana D is important character and Kirby's sidekick. Tweets like these are funny to me because the loud Kirby fans just see red anytime the anime gets brought up. Here's three different Kirby games where you hear Kirby saying the forbidden word. <laughs> Let's take out the 20-year-old anime out of your rent-free heads for a second, and let me direct you to three other relevant sources of video game media that contribute to Kin DDD and Meta Knight's misconceptions to the public eye. The first video game source is Splatoon 2, a 4v4 team shooter where the goal is to cover the stage with as much of your team's ink color as possible, versus the other team who is also doing the same. Splatoon 2 has these special global timed events called Splatfests where players can choose a themed team to fight for. In December of 2018, there was a Splatfest themed Heroes vs. Villains, with some familiar Nintendo faces. On the hero side, you have Kirby. On the villain side, you have Kin DDD. I'm sure a whole lot of people got exposed to DDD being with the bad guys. The second video game source is Super Smash Bros. In the latest installment, Ultimate, we've had quite a few newcomers who happen to be more on the antagonistic side, making Ultimate the most stacked game in the series of villains. But because this is the internet, and everyone is here, including their fan bases, character talk and discussions can get ugly quickly. If you were ever grouping Meta Knight and or Kin Dedede together with the rest of the villains at any point online, you have committed a Kirby war crime. You know the most confusing thing to me was that some people think that Meta Knight is a villain because he was literally never used in actively antagonistic role except for one time you can at least make an argument for Day Data even if it's wrong. In one of the newcomers trailers, who happens to be a villain, King K. Rule, the beginning sequence plays a reel of characters duking it out with their enemy. And would you look at that? Kirby is there with Meta Knight. In Kirby's classic mode, right before you take on Marks, you're battling against Kin DDD on the Fountain of Dreams while fighting over food. You know, the pay homage at Kirby's Dreamland 1 where you fight DDD for the sake of food. But I guess there's no Castle DDD stage, so Fountain of Dreams had to do. Anytime you boot up the game, Ultimate will tell you an online themed tournament event will be ongoing where everyone plays with specific rules, stages, and characters decided by the developers. There's a specific tourney event called Heroes vs. Villains, which is self-explanatory. 
Hey, who is in the back with the other villains? What? Is that Meta Knight? Although Kindidity isn't on this picture, both him and Meta Knight are playable in that event mode. One can conclude the Kirby series didn't get a new villain rep because DDD and Meta Knight have been around there since Brawl who fill that role. This is Sakurai's game, the creator of Kirby after all. But Meta, Sakurai's not representing the franchise well at all. He's neglecting modern Kirby. You know what? You're right. Another misconception the franchise has is that Sakurai still works at HAL Labs, meaning every Kirby game that's come out recently was made by Sakurai, which is not true. The last Kirby game Sakurai was credited for was Kirby and the Amazing Mirror back in 2004. Nowadays, it's the general director, Shinya Kumazaki, who takes the helm for the series. The third video game source that contributes to Meta Knight and Ken DDD's misconceptions of their villainy, the video game series they come from. Kirby. In the very first game in the franchise, the plot kicks off with the King of Dreamland, DDD, stealing all the food from Dreamland. In Meta Knight's case from Superstar, he decided that Dreamland was full of lazy beta cucks who do nothing but eat, sleep, and play all day and decided it was time to take over with his armed battleship the Halberd. If we're ignoring remakes from a storytelling point of view, the strongest counter-argument I've seen when it comes to this duo being villains is that they were morally evil once. Keyword on morally. Guys, DDD famished his entire country once. He's not a bad guy. Aside from them being a bunch of villains, there's four other explanations. Misunderstandings, rivalries, doppelgangers, and an acronym that I like to use called CMP, which I'll reveal later. In Kirby's Adventure, the residents of Dreamland aren't experiencing dreams anymore because something happened at the Dream Spring. And DDD took the Star Rod, snapped that joint into pieces, and gave it to his friends. I guess Kirby isn't a part of that friend group. Kirby gathers all the pieces, returns to the Dream Spring, and fights DDD since he's been puppy guarding the spring the entire time. Kirby defeats DDD and puts the Star Rod back in its place after disregarding DDD's resistance. Uh oh! Kirby just let out the big bad monster that is Nightmare. In his debut game Kirby's Adventure, Meta Knight will send his army the Meta Knights after Kirby throughout the journey, and will eventually take matters into his own hands and fights Kirby himself. In Kirby's Squeak Squad, CAKE HAS BEEN ROBBED! Kirby blames Kin DDD immediately and attacks everyone who gets in his way, including Kin DDD himself. Meta Knight later in that same game is shown actively stealing a chest from both the Squeaks and Kirby, the one that they were fighting over. Kirby spends an entire level beating up anyone that gets in his way, including Meta Knight in the end. In a video game series that focuses on friendship, wouldn't that any of these moments these two characters or even Kirby decide to talk it out? Because when HAL Labs forces misunderstanding boss fights among friends, it makes all parties involved look very foolish, and these events could have all been avoided entirely. Great storytelling, guys! You'll have events such as the Gourmet Race, where Kirby and Kin Dedede will duke it out in not just a race, but a special race to see who's the hungriest! Kirby Fighters 2, where both Meta Knight and Kin Dedede challenge Kirby to a duel atop the Buddies Fighters Tower. Or even in the most recent game, Kirby in the Forgotten Land, where you challenge Meta Knight at the Coliseum in Waddle Dee Town. A duel where the two of you can fight with no world or life threatening stakes. Because that's how rival fights should be. But the idea of the Coliseum in a Waddle Dee Town gets weird, because we're also seeing fighting bosses in there who are considered your enemy. In an arena full of Waddle Dees, which they're after. There's an imposter among us because, wow, that movement is hella sus! Instead of creating original bosses that could be added into the series, let's keep using Kin DDD and Meta Knight as boss fodder. But let's be sneaky about it. In Planet Robobot, when Popstar is being invaded by a robotic organization, Meta Knight and DDD rally their troops to stop the extraterrestrial attack. The Halberg is shot out of the sky, and Castle DDD is now. Castle Rubble. When Kirby reaches the end of the fifth area in that game, Susie the secretary from Houtman Works Company is there to greet the Pink Puffball. To stop Kirby in his tracks, Susie sends out a boss created from the latest in nanogenetic technology. A DDD clone! Not just one DDD clone, but three! Kin DDD spends the entire game sleeping under his castle rubble, but apparently, Susie somehow managed to acquire DNA from Kin DDD? Even the game doesn't know how she managed that. But when Kin DDD isn't present, he still manages to find a way to grief Kirby. One of Kirby's biggest problems when it comes to storytelling is their excessive use of CPM. 
corruption, mind control, and possession. Or you can swap out the possession word for puppeteer. It's all the same thing. In the Dark Matter trilogy, as talked about earlier, DDD falls victim to this. Three times! Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, shame on the Howl Laboratory, because it's just getting annoying! But guys, why does the general gaming audience think DDD is evil again? It only happened one time! Well, maybe Howl should stop reminding the audience of the first game where it all happened, whether it be remakes or just straight-up references to it, like the very beginning of Star Allies, because those are much more relevant reminders of it. At this moment, I would pull out my camera and say, here's where we can see DDD being a villain more than once during the franchise in 4K, but I unfortunately don't have 4K quality. So instead, here's where we see DDD being a villain more than once during the franchise in 720p. In Kirby Superstar Ultra, there's a mode called Revenge of the King that takes place after the events of Kirby's Dreamland. Wait, what happened in that game again? Oh, that's right, he stole all the food from Dreamland and the sparkling stars. Sparkling stars that helped the people of Dreamland gather food. Kirby stopped them. And now he wants revenge? His age-old nemesis? Kirby stopped your people from dying, and you're mad about it by holding a grudge? Guys, I'm sure they're just friendly rivals here. So friendly that King DDD uses his entire army, a giant blimp that shoots out cannonballs, and a giant metallic hammer equipped with a flamethrower and missiles that he uses on Kirby, and nobody else in the franchise. When the loud Kirby fans are defending their fellow Penguin from the villain claims, they like to specifically bring up the mainline games. Wouldn't you want to use as many games as possible to help your case that King DDD is a friend? DDD defended the Dream Spring with good intentions back in 1993, so I think it's fair game to go back and look at the other games roughly in that time period. Kirby's Dream Course. King DDD has stolen all of Dreamland stars. Kirby's Block Ball. King DDD has stolen the sparkling stars once again. Kirby's Star Stacker. There is a star called Mr. Star flying over Popstar peacefully, and then King DDD shoots a cannon at him because he thought it would be funny. Yeah, good intentions. Kirby's Tilt and Tumble. King DDD has stolen the stars of Popstar again. The Penguin's villainous resume doesn't end there. Kirby Mass Attack, a much more recent game. Kirby gets attacked by the evil wizard Necrodius, which turns Kirby into 10 weaker Kirbys, limiting his power. Kirby is quite literally cursed right now. By this point in the timeline since this game came out in the 2010s, DDD and Kirby are friends, right? Kin DDD should help his friend in need. So what does he do? He gets in his hot air balloon and starts chucking bombs at him. <laughs> Incredible character development, guys. Kicking friends while they're down. No, no, even worse than kicking. Throwing explosives at your friends when they're down. Bombs away! That way. Kirby's Battle Royale. Kirby tagged along with Bandana Waddle D, an actual friend, are invited to the DDD Cake Royale a tournament where the winner wins a giant cake. I wonder why the loud Kirby fans ignore this game. <laughs> hey, let's, uh, let's watch some cutscenes. What? They're still winning. Hey, you think, dude, that it turns out Kirby's good in every battle? That bit squeaked. I made up these battles to boost him down size, so he better get to losing already or else. Hey, you staying out to there that Kirby ruined your battles. Well, no one makes a fool of King Dede. He, no one. Hey, you get to crank it. We've got to turn up the heat. Yes, your majesty. What's that? Minute not just keeps on winning. That chump thinks he can do as he pleases in my tournament. But would not and I be able to take down Kirby? That's even worse. He'd make my Kirby printer scheme look bad. I guess we'll just have to pulverize the both of that. Crank this thing up to ten. I need stronger Kirby. Yes, 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 right away, King D did it. We did it. We really did it. We're the champions. Can you believe it, Kirby? We fought side by side through all those different kinds of battles. Thank you, Kirby. Now for our prize, that amazing and tried to look cake. No way. Not yet. You think you won. This is far from over. But we won fair and square, your majesty. So, who cares? This is my tournament. I'll do what I want. But that's not fair. Alright everyone, let's count the amount of times King DDD has helped Kirby out without being a direct adversary to him. <laughs> One! But Meta, what about Kirby Triple Deluxe? 
Kirby 64, and Forgotten Land. You know what? You're right. He does help. After trying to fight Kirby when the world or galaxy is in danger. What I found hilarious is that in Kirby 64, even before DDD gets possessed by Dark Matter for the third time, he was already being an asshole. And it's really funny because you'll see these Kirby lore videos defending DDD. And they say that he's just been an older brother here. However, Kirby 64 goes a little further beyond enhancing DDD's characterization. He's teasing like an older brother, snagging the crystal shard away from Kirby before he goes and gets possessed again. <laughs> what a funny prank, DDD! We're trying to send an alien fairy back to her people and stop the evil dark energy that infested her home planet, but you're out here making everything worse like you normally do. In Forgotten Line at the 11th hour, after the second possessed DDD boss fight in that game, there's a cutscene that a lot of DDD fans enjoyed and loved to use as a moment of defense for their penguin. So let me just show you the cutscene. Although I will say this cutscene is good, it does contain quite a few problems in it. For starters, these circumstances wouldn't be happening in the first place if DDD didn't get possessed. Meta Knight was able to fight it off, why couldn't DDD? The former has spent less time being CMP'd than the latter, which is more embarrassing for DDD's character. We also get hit with the cliche, help! I'm falling and I can't get up! Go on without me! DDD runs back to help the Waddle Dee. Don't you have an inhale attack? You know, the one you use during the boss fight? DDD has used it before in other games during fight pinches. In Kirby 64, when the gang is escaping Neostar, Kirby uses the inhale to scoop up Waddle Dee since he couldn't quite catch up to the portal. So why not do it here? DDD throws the Waddle Dee to Kirby and the others so they can proceed onward while DDD stays behind to fight back the resistance. A few levels earlier, the bosses of the Beast Pack tried to stop Kirby from getting any further and were thwarted on the way over here. The enemies chasing the party right now are a couple of regular mooks that Kirby could beat in, hmm, maybe give or take three seconds. It's real hard for me to feel any form of tension for a threat so minuscule. Let's say DDD managed to save that Waddle Dee and made it back with the others. One elevator ride in hallway later, he would most definitely succumb to CMP again, knowing his awful win-loss ratio against foes who can control their enemies since Kirby was on his way to the heart of the operations. I would have a much easier time convincing a newcomer to the Kirby series that DDD is a villain than he is a hero. He manages to fit into all four of these categories, and he has a bunch of different boss compilation videos on YouTube. You don't normally see heroes having that. I could also say he's similar to a familiar face from the Super Mario Bros. series. People really like to equate Day 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 with Bowser when he should be equated with Peach, ruler of the hero's homeland. Competes with and helps the hero frequently. Always seems to be a pawn in a bigger scheme against the hero slash kingdom. Kind of a glutton. Kidnapped at least once. Wrong! I would equate DDD with Bowser. Many more similarities with each other than Princess Peach. And guess what? Kumazaki would agree with me! In May of 2018, Nintendo Dream interviewed the staff from HAL Laboratory about various topics from Kirby Star Allies. Translations were primarily done with a Deep L translator tool by Gigi's blog, which can be found in the description. Why did the boss, King Day Day Day, take on a macho appearance. I didn't think it would be right for DDD to be absent as a boss in a compilation title. Just like Bowser in Super Mario, I wanted DDD to reign as the standard boss character. However, recently they've been adventuring together and he's become a bit of a good friend, but this time, thanks to being brainwashed by a dark heart, we can now fight the real DDD. Standard boss character, huh? 
You can't have your cake and eat it too. HAL is stuck on the fence where they want their iconic DDD fights, but that also can't really work if he's good friends of Kirby. But thanks to CMP, they can fight! Woohoo! Because they haven't milked that cow to death yet, and overall hurts your storytelling of the series if DDD is that much of an idiot to fall for the same trick repeatedly. Do I think DDD is a villain? No. Do I think DDD is a hero? Also, no. Do I think DDD is an antagonist? Absolutely. And these cases equal to boss fights and opposition, regardless of DDD's morals. So maybe it's time for HAL Labs to retire both Meta Knight and DDD as boss fights if they're going to be the good guys, because Bandana Wallow D has never had this problem. But Meta, we need our boss fights for DDD remixes! Characters and stages being absent from a Kirby game has never stopped HAL Labs from making one. several video game factors for misconceptions, but no, let's keep blaming the anime. Here we go! I'm running on empty, man. Behold! Whoa. A saucy, zesty masterpiece! Ain't nothing better than this! <laughs> Get out, dumbass! I've had enough of this dude showing up in my games, and I hate him. Wispy Woods is my least favorite character in the Kirby series, so let's keep that in mind going forward. Every now and then when Sonic the Hedgehog discourse is going down on Twitter, whether it be a joke or intentional, you'll have individuals trying to drag down other IP games in the process. The classic Green Hill Zone vs Wispy Woods, where the former is angry and hopping mad because Sega used that location again, where the latter is excited popping off for the 842nd time. As a Sonic and Kirby fan who hates Green Hill Zone but also hates Wispy Woods even more, threads like this help me validate my hatred for this leafy log. Because when the loud Kirby fans sense any form of criticism come into their beloved franchise, they come rushing in with a defense battalion, regardless of what said criticism is being told. In this case, makes them look like idiots. Sonic fans, screams and cries about them reusing levels. Kirby fans, I love this fucking tree, man. Wispy Woods always gets unique boss fights and circumstances that keeps him fresh. In Star Allies he's sending waves of apples at you. In Planet Robobot he's literally a killer robot chasing you down meanwhile Green Hill just takes up space and does nothing interesting every time. Bruh stop the cap it's the same tree boss in nearly ever Kirby game with minor differences. Minor differences. Wait, didn't that guy say Wispy Woods always gets unique boss fights? Why is he only showing two? Look man I won't say they're nothing alike, but they put a large enough twist every time to keep things exciting. It's part of Kirby's formula, and they do a damn good job with it. Sonic on the other hand has been recycling the same shit with little difference since generations. Same fucking tree boss. You're not convincing me at all. You know what I'm not dealing with you anymore cry about to someone else I'm muting you now so feel free to fuck off. <laughs> yeah, the other user was the one crying. Sure, buddy. Sure. Kirby fans who don't like returning bosses are God's weakest soldiers. Actually though if you don't like there being a new Wispy Woods or Day 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 fight and think the devs are lazy for that then fuck you. Whoa! Well forgive me for getting sick of fighting the same bosses every game, especially Wispy Woods. I don't think Hell Labs is lazy at all, I just think they're very uncreative. Because when it comes to recycling bosses in video games, Wispy Woods is one of the worst hills to die on because you're quite literally defending a tree! Although characters like King DDD share the same problem, at least you can do more with him. You can give him more weapons to wield, or he can behave differently. Wispy, on the other hand, doesn't have that sort of freedom. As a stationary tree, he's stuck dropping apples, attacking with roots, or shooting air bullets. Imagine if Kirby fans got mad at Kirby fighting Wispy Woods every game. In Kirby Superstar Ultra, you fight Wispy Woods not once, not twice, not thrice, but 14 times! Oh my god! Wispy also gets slightly reinvented for every game not to mention that most Wispy Woods introduce a new gimmick and most times design. Hey guys, check out my new OC! It's called Leafy Woods, my original character! Riven in tree design and riven in tree gameplay. Instead of dropping apples on Kirby's head, this time he's dropping bombs! Or cherries! Or rots! Or whatever the heck is up there! Wow, how Labs is so unique! 
The difference between Wispy Woods and Green Hill Zone is that Wispy Woods being the first boss of every Kirby game feels like tradition, whereas Green Hill Zone's repeated usage just feels like a cross between a lack of imagination and a strong desire to play it safe. For those out of the loop since this is a Kirby video after all, and you may not be aware of Sonic the Hedgehog, Green Hill Zone 9 times out of 10 when it gets brought back, it's the first zone in the game. Why isn't Green Hill Zone considered to be tradition here? Because it's been used less or because it's been used more recently? And why isn't Wispy Woods considered repeated usage, a lack of imagination, and a strong desire to play it safe? They're both being used repeatedly. A common thing I see about the Wispy Woods vs Green Hill argument is that it's not exactly a fair comparison. One of them is a character, and the other is a location. This should be a fair comparison because Wispy Woods is located in Green Greens. Uh oh, Hal Labs made an oopsie again, because a stationary tree just doesn't stay there. One day he's at Grassland, then he's at Vegetable Valley, then he's at Green Grounds! Popo Islands?! Any story explanations here? Nope, he's just there guys. After getting blown off the Halberd in Superstar and Superstar Ultra, Kirby is on some random island where he runs into Wispy Woods. After that fight, Kirby falls through the floor and fights Twin Woods! What?! Why are there two of you?! Somebody tell me please! Kirby when he ends up washed ashore on an entirely different planet only to find Wispy Woods five minutes later. If this happens in the Forgotten Land I'm gonna shit myself. It doesn't stop a Forgotten Land either. In Milky Way Wishes when you're on a completely different planet, there he is! In Kirby Star Allies you fight Wispy Woods in Dreamland. Later on in the game when Kirby is flung out to the other end of the galaxy, on Faluna Moon, you fight Wispy again, a second time, in the campaign. After that fight, walk to the right again, and you're fighting in a lowland version of Wispy Woods. There's just no way! Kirby fans when they see trees exist IRL, it's a reference to Wispy Woods which means Earth repeats the same formula over and over again. Imagine if Kirby fans got mad at Kirby fighting Wispy Woods every game. You're darn right I get mad and dislike Wispy Woods, because I actually go outside. Let's say you come across an evil tree! You again? <laughs> the people who choose to die on that hill will reference a select handful of Wispy fights, like Dreamland 3 and Kirby Triple Deluxe. The former starts running around, and the latter starts jumping around. Trees don't do that. Or how about Kirby in the Forgotten Land, where one of Wispy's Alolan forms uproots a metal fence from the earth? Trees don't do that. Or, how about the biggest one these wispy huggers love to bring up? Kirby Planet Robobot, where you're fighting a metal tree that shoots out missiles and fires drill cannons and has an engine. Once again, trees don't do that. In order to make Wispy Woods a more interesting character, you need to give him untree-like characteristics to make this boring character any interesting. So instead of scraping the bottom of the tree barrel, Howl Labs, you can actually go get an original boss character to take his place. In Forgotten Land, in a beast pack full of furries, why is there some random tropical tree there with them? Sticks out like a sore thumb. Friend attack! Attack! Friend! Wait, wait, what? Why can't I play as Wispy Woods, guys? That's so weird! I wonder why it's not possible! He is a mainstay character, after all! We need our tradition! Wispy is a staple! Wispy is a part of the Kirby formula! No, you do not need him. Did you know that in Forgotten Land they removed the goal game? You know, that iconic minigame you play anytime you beat a stage? Forgotten Land never suffered due to the lack of it. You can remove this tree from ANY Kirby game, and the story will remain unchanged because that's how useless Wispy Woods is. When it comes to how Laboratory and their storytelling for show and tell, they tend to lean much more on the tell, and when they do tell, it's very lacking and or falls on deaf ears. Because Kirby game plots have nothing until the 11th hour, you learn next to nothing about the villains. The villains that decide to talk are having one-way conversations because Kirby refuses to speak. Kirby can speak, but I guess he's taking a vow of silence or something. Kirby can talk in the game manuals from Kirby's Dreamland and Adventure, and also talks in Kirby's Epic Yarn. One day, Kirby saw his favorite food, a bright red tomato, on top of a bush. 
down the hatch. When the loud Kirby fans hits you with the classic, have you played the Kirby games? It's a simple question that is loaded with layers. You could have played every Kirby game that's out there right now, like they asked you, but can still miss out on story elements. How Lab's decision to give the stories more depth was to add in boss flavor text. Where is it, you might ask? It's in the pause screen, of course. Duh. The idea started in 2008's Kirby Superstar Ultra. Now, what the loud Kirby fans should be asking is, have you played the Kirby games and have you read all the boss pause screens? None of the games tell you they exist, and the only way you'll find out about them is if you find them by complete accident or some Kirby fan lets you know about them. This is horrible game design, but of course the Kirby Apologist Stampede are on their way to defend Mr. Pause Lore Guy. Actual Kirby Lore, Kirby Lore and Games. I could be talking about how shitty their way of storytelling is for the 745th time but it's 3am and I'm tired as shit. I like the way they tell their story since they make it optional and you can still understand what's going on. If they explained their story in a way other than pause screens then it wouldn't feel like a Kirby game. Imagine if every other video game told its story through pause screens making you stop your gameplay every time. Yeah, no thanks. I mean you don't have to. It's their cause it's optional. That info can and should be placed somewhere else in the story where it can't be missed. Its only location is a pause screen for specific bosses and that's dumb. Not within cutscenes itself or in the gallery. That's just bad design placement. Like I said, it's optional. It's not even an option if a new player doesn't even know it's an option. That's how out of the way that optional dialogue is unless you stumble upon by accident or someone else tells you it exists. That's what I'm getting at. It's literally the pause screen, it's the first thing you see in the pause screens. Plus it's optional and acts like a pleasant surprise since no one expects Kingdom Hearts lore in a game where you chase a blue penguin. Except, the average person doesn't pause their video game in every room they walk into. Having that as the first thing you see in the pause menu is irrelevant. Unless you happen to pause in a boss fight by sheer accident or had to get off the game in that moment. Like I said, it's optional. Besides, only die-hard Kirby fans care about the lore. Apologist energy if I've ever seen it. When you catch a Pokémon in the mainline games, the Pokédex will give you an entry about the new Pokémon you caught. From there, it's optional if the player wants to read that information or not. In Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, when you get Goombella, the game tells you that she can use a tattle ability. So it's up to the player if they want to tattle others or not. The reason it's in the pause screens and not properly in the game itself is so that the target demographic, literal young children don't have to worry about anything but learning how to play and having fun but if you were older or wanted to you could look for more that's there. If your argument is that the Kirby target demograph is for literal young children, then what's the point of having any form of content for older players? With that logic, the baby game should have no pause screen descriptions at all. Now let's check out a pause screen from our good old friend Wispy Woods. Kirby's familiar foe is back. Bright-eyed, bushy-headed, and dropping more apples than should even be possible. Use your friend abilities of up and cut them down to size. Don't have to tell me twice. DDD, get the chainsaw! Guys, what a fantastic character with great depth and fleshed out personality. Mr. Pause Screen Guy does this a lot with the pause flavor text descriptions in the story modes. Super vague remarks, the complete obvious, nothing substantial, or when there is something substantial, he doesn't fully commit to it. Krako is another Kirby boss that gets brought back just as much as Wispy Woods. Although he shares the same problems of series fatigue, at least he's a flying lightning cloud, and from a storytelling perspective, it makes sense that he's in multiple locations since he can fly. Anyways, Krako is very aggressive, has taken a vow of silence, and attacks Kirby in multiple games. In Kirby Fighters Deluxe, if you're playing the hardest difficulty, because this doesn't show up in the other difficulties for some reason, if you pause in his fight, Mr. Pause Lore Guy tells you this. You. Did you think I'd forget? The time you smashed into me with your high jump. That time I was betrayed by helpers. Or when I was replaced by that mechanical cloud. I I. Sniff. There's something in my eye. Forget what? Krakow is crying here, why, why should I care? 
Krakow in the past attacks unprovoked, and how would you even know about Squeak Squad's mechanical cloud? Were you even there? These loud Kirby fans never want to shut up about Kirby Star Allies lore, so let's check out some of the villains we meet along the way. Oh hey, so three mate sisters! Calm, cool, and collected, Frozen General Franciscan is one of three mages at the head of Jambastian's forces. The freezing attacks she unleashes are enough to chill the very hearts of those who oppose her. Wow, I never would have guessed she was an Ice-type user. Thanks, Mr. Pause Screen Guy! One of the three Jambastian mages. The blazing General Flombage rains fiery vengeance upon any who stand in her way. She gets pretty mad if anyone does anything to upset Francisca. In fact, she's kind of riled up right now. Wow, this this chick is pretty pissed off because we beat her sister. The dutiful leader of the three Jambastian mages, Lightning General Zan Partisan seems to energize the fortress itself and uses high-speed attacks to render her prey helpless. At the bidding of some unknown power, she hunts for dark hearts. And there's the trifecta. One fights of ice, the other with fire, and last of lightning, who happens to be their leader of the three. Undeterred from her quest to find the dark hearts that have rained down across the galaxy, the frozen general is back and tougher than ever before. Her duties have kept her away from Flombage lately. She kind of misses her. Huh? Aren't you guys a trifecta? Why don't you miss your lightning sister? She's supposed to be looking for dark hearts, but Flombage has found her way to a nice, toasty spot and is taking a bit of a break. She'd like to invite Francisca to join her but worries she might melt in the heat. I don't like where this is going. Ha, ha, ha. Come on Francisca. Let's get wild. What the heck is this, Fire Emblem Fates? Mr. Paw Screen Guy, what are you trying to say? But Meta, obviously Hot Labs is referring to a religious sisterhood. The first thing somebody would think of when you mention sisters is that they're blood related. It could be sisterhood since they have the magic sin and whatnot, but the problem here is that it's never clear. And in fact, it gets a whole lot worse. In an official Play Nintendo Activities poll, you have the option to pick which family would be the most fun. Mario and Luigi, Cappy and Tiara, Timmy and Tommy, and Francisca and her sisters. Mr. Paw Screen Guy managed to have another obscure area to hide in. On the news section on the Nintendo Switch menu, you can check out channels on different games with messages from the developers. On the fifth channel update for Kirby Star Allies, it's about hidden secrets about the boss characters. They share elemental weaknesses for the bosses in the game. Later on in that post, they talk about the Jambastian mages who are referred to as three sisters in the pause screen. And I open quote, So are they actually siblings or members of a sisterhood of mages? Just like Kirby and Meta Knight's secrets, this is another mystery that stirs the imagination. Close quote. FBI, open up! <laughs> Francisca and Flombage have been implied to share a romantic bond with each other. Chinya Kamazaki states that their bond may be deeper than just comrades, and in a Kirby underscore JP Twitter post, Flombage states that Francisca's drawing is so cute that it makes her chest fire up. People saw this tweet and either got confused or uncomfortable because they're sisters. And of course there's always somebody acting as a secret service for HAL Laboratories. For people confused, the mage sisters are only sisters as in a religious sisterhood. They all came from different planets until Highness found them. So I asked this Twitter user if HAL ever confirmed this in writing. Literally in their pause screen descriptions for Soul Melter X. I don't see any mention of religious sisterhood or different planets. Was it stated anywhere else I'm missing? First off the pause screens clearly state they were all found separately, and second, never trust the English pause screens to be accurate, especially with star allies. First you tell me it's in the pause screen, I see it's not there, then you tell me to never trust the pause screens, especially with star allies. The game with the sisters in question, and then the Twitter user sends me a Google Doc PowerPoint about lesbians! What the hell is this? I apologize for bringing up Sonic again, but to make a quick comparison to Kirby's pause screens with another video game, let's look at the 2005 game Shadow the Hedgehog. Spoiler warning ahead, so skip to this part of the video if you're sensitive to that. Shadow the Hedgehog is trying to find out who he really is. During the final boss of the game, Dr. Eggman says this. Shadow, can you hear me? 
This might be the last chance I have to speak to you, so what I said about having created you, it was all a lie. Everyone thought you died during that horrible incident, but I rescued you with one of my robots. You lost your memory, that's all. You really are the ultimate life form my grandfather created. You get this information roughly 10 minutes into the boss fight. This is a super boss fight involving Chaos Emeralds where you're fighting on borrowed time, meaning players are pressured to speedrun the battle. Several players will miss this crucial information. Players are led to believe that Shadow is an android because the very first playthrough of the game, the easiest path to take is straight through the middle, the neutral route. Multiple Shadow androids, Shadow even calls himself one, and Eggman said he made him. Have fun reaching the end of the game, by the way. Anyways, back to Kirby. In Forgotten Land, HAL Labs got rid of the pause screen descriptions and replaced it with figurines. I guess copyability movesets were a matched set because they also got fired with Mr. Pazler guy in the process. People are trying to argue now that having descriptions in Forgotten Land with figurines rather than in pause screens like in past modern games is a bad thing and I genuinely can't help but disagree hard. What figurines have over the pause screens is that the player will know they exist because the game tells you about them. The issue of these figures lore is that most of the ones that you get in the game are completely random. And there's 256 of them in the game! I wonder if that Twitter user from earlier is punching the water right now because Forgotten Land no longer feels like a Kirby game. How Labs managed to one-up themselves because they found yet another place to put in story that isn't the story mode. Miiverse was a social network for the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. Players can make posts and interact with each other with 3DS and Wii U game communities. For the Kirby 3DS games, the developers would have their own special community where they could post in it. It was called Behind the Scenes. Just like the pause screens, let's take a look at what the developers had to say. This time we have a message about Waddle Dees, from the lead designer. Hi everyone. Today I'd like to talk to you about Waddle Dees, who appear in numerous places throughout the game. These cute little characters have appeared in every game in the Kirby series, and I have a real soft spot for them. This game is, I think, the first time ever in the series that the Waddle Dees have actually attacked Kirby. You think? How do you not know? Through such methods as chopping down trees as he passes, or rolling boulders at him. I say attack, but it's not that Waddle Dees are malicious in any way, it's just that whatever they do, they end up causing problems for Kirby. You can't really hold a grudge against them for that. I will most definitely hold a grudge against them because they're not chopping down wispy woods. There's a post about Revenge of the King from Superstar Ultra. That game had the first appearance of Mask DDD where he puts on a power amplifying mask. Nobody knows where he got it. If you don't know where he got it, nobody will! In Kirby Fighters 2, the final boss fight has Meta Knight and DDD putting on the Mask of Dark Bonds. We don't know where these come from either. Hey! Someone referenced the Miiverse post before Forgotten Land came out! It's about DDD! Let's check it out! For every Kirby fan that is potentially worried that DDD's role will amount to getting possessed or beastified in the Forgotten Land or whatever, I got tangible proof that this won't happen. Shinya Kamazaki is aware of repetitious tropes and how bland they can get. That cow is deceased and in a ditch. When creating a cutscene, myself or the cutscene designer would start by sketching out a simple four-frame storyboard to serve as a basis for the creation of the cutscene. For the opening cutscene we decided to keep the plot simple, which suits the fact that Kirby doesn't really speak. Besides, some people just want to get straight into the action, so, with such players in mind, we decided to start the story off quite simply. Also for that reason, we had the idea to reserve deeper background and secrets for the special page, which can be viewed. HAL LABS have you ever heard of a skip button? Because players who just want to get straight into the action would naturally try to mash the confirm or pause button during cutscenes because skippable cutscenes are common in video games, unlike pause screen description. For the final boss in Kirby Triple Deluxe, not even the pause screen tells you why Queen Sectonia oppressed the people of the sky in Popstar. It gets posted in Miiverse instead. Another reason the Dimension Mirror was chosen for this key role, explained in the previous post, 
and ended up decorating Queen Sectonia's chambers, is that mirrors go hand in hand with the idea of beauty. But how exactly did Queen Sectonia actually get her hands on the mirror? Well, her underling Taranza stole it from the mirror world, and gave it as tribute to his beauty-obsessed queen. Sadly, it was gazing into the mirror day after day that led to her mind being twisted towards tyranny by its power. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror? Now we're getting some continuity. Let's go. This is why Amazing Mirror's continuity here is bad. Queen Sectonia is behaving the way she is because she gazed into the Dimension Mirror corrupting her, the classic CMP. But how did she get this mirror? Well, you see, Taranza stole it for her from the Mirror World. How did that happen? Isn't somebody protecting that world? Oh, that's right, it's Shadow Kirby. How did he let Taranza get away with that? In fact, Shadow Kirby never even tries to get the mirror back ever during Triple Deluxe's story. Absolutely nowhere to be seen. In the version of the game in Kirby, Triple Deluxe, we wanted to emphasize that your worst enemy is yourself, so the final boss was a Shadow Kirby that had the same copy ability as you. I am flabbergasted that Hal Labs is blatantly ignoring the ending of Amazing Mirror, unless he forgot that character already exists. Mr. Pause Screen Lore Guy gives us more information about Shadow Kirby in Kirby Fighters 2. Kirby's shadow is back for more. This stubby gray ball seems to think he's pulling a little prank, but he's way too powerful for that. He's pulling a prank? Go back to your own world and defend it, you clown! Mr. Pause Screen Lore Guy also says that he's a naughty shadow and suggests that he's the guardian of the mirror world. For all the Kirby mysteries that exist out there, this one still confounds me. They have to be doing this on purpose now. They have to. They keep swapping Shadow Kirby's in practically every other appearance now. I need the confirmation on what's happening here. I have to know. All of this Shadow Kirby nonsense is confusing at best, horrible storytelling at worst. Because Shadow Kirby is supposed to be an ally, a friend, friendship-based franchise by the way. The events in Triple Deluxe of the Dimension Mirror getting stolen and the entire planet being engulfed in vines. It's bizarre how none of the animal friends, or even Mennonite, come out to help. Did they look outside the window, say it's too early for this, and went back to bed? Most of them can fly! Mennonite can just sense when something is wrong in the mirror dimension, and he has a flying battleship. Would have made chasing Taranzo a whole lot easier! Satoshi Ishida and Shinya Kumazaki hosted a Miiverse exclusive Q&A event back in 2016 where the Kirby community could ask questions relating to Kirby Planet Robobot. Of course, they got a flood of story questions. Surprise, surprise. It seems there are a lot of people out there who read very deeply into the game as they are playing. I'd like to start us off with a question about Meta Knight. At the start of the game, we see the halberd get shot down, but by the time it shows up again, it's in full working order. Who repaired it? The Halberd made a crash landing between the cliffs in the space directly beneath Access Arkansas Meta Knight was then captured by the Haltman Works Company, but managed to entrust the Halberd to his crew. As a result, the repairs were finished in time and the Halberd could rush to Kirby's rescue, with Meta Knight back to his old self. Once again, 11th hour storytelling not doing any Kirby game any favors. Now I've got a question for the viewers at home. Is this character a robot? Susie, the executive assistant of the extraterrestrial assistant of the Haltman Works Company, who invaded Planet Popstar with a robotic army, has two bolts on her head and debuted in the game called Planet Robobot? Is she a robot? If you said yes, congratulations! You're incorrect. I don't blame you for thinking she's one, but it's already too late. The Loud Kirby fans are in your walls. I still think about the time people were calling Susie a robot and spreading false information in the fandom and the Kirby fans actually bombed their mentions so hard they left Twitter LMFAO based. Very based indeed! Let's bully people off the platform for making a justifiable mistake. Thank you for keeping the Kirby fandom safe from these terrible people. We wouldn't want misconceptions poisoning our rivers. It's not like this information is exclusively a Nintendo app that's dead. For those out of the loop, Miiverse shut down in 2017, the same year the Switch came out. The Twitter user who made that post got jumped in 2021, long after Miiverse disappeared. Hal even wanted to make a robotic double of Susie for the story initially, 
but he ended up scrapping the idea. Even with Miiverse gone, there were still two questions asked during the Robobot Q&A that is giving Kirby's storytelling, long-term, and ongoing consequences while also taking out HAL Labs' most wasted character in the franchise. That wasn't a tree. In Meta Nightmare Ultra from Kirby Superstar Ultra, Meta Knight summons Galactic Nova, which can grant the user any wish of their choosing. Meta Knight wishes to fight the greatest warrior in the galaxy. That wish releases a character who was sealed away out of fear because his power was too great. Enter Galactonite. This lance leaping menace has made a physical appearance in five different Kirby games. Here's where the more obvious plot holes start revealing themselves due to this character's introduction. In Milky Way Wishes from Superstar and its remake Superstar Ultra, Kirby was already gathering the power of the stars to summon the Galactic Nova. When Marks showed his hand and betrayed the Pink Puffball, Kirby later sends Mark packing along with a casualty in the process. Blown up in the vacuum of space. It shouldn't be possible for Meta Knight to summon Galactic Nova because it's dead. Let's check on Miiverse and hopefully find some answers. Speaking of Meta Knight, here's a question about Meta Nightmare Returns. Is there any connection plot-wise between this mode and the main game's story mode? It's basically an alternate storyline. Meta Nightmare Returns is a kind of bonus mode that you unlock after finishing the main game, but that alone doesn't hold much appeal for a player so we made it into a what-if scenario. While we're on the topic of Meta Nightmare Returns, Galactonite was supposed to be sealed away in a crystal, but he broke that seal and showed up again in the true arena. Are Meta Nightmare Returns and the True Arena connected at all in relation to the story? The True Arena is like another what-if scenario, so you can't really consider everything to be connected. Furthermore, the extra-dimensional road that opens up when Galactonite appears transcends space-time, so it's difficult to give it a concrete place in the timeline. But if you consider the stages in which Galactonite appeared in the past three games, I think that will give you some food for thought. That truly is some food for thought, so let's start unpacking it. We now know that the main game story modes for Kirby games are canon, and the extra side modes are not canon, even to the extent of alternative storyline what-ifs. That explains the side modes in the Kirby franchise. If Kirby finished off all the levels, enemies, bosses, and conflicts from the main mode, it doesn't make sense when either Kirby or some other character goes out and fights those same enemies and bosses, who should be defeated, and or their EX Deviant Tart recolors. For a boss rush mode, it doesn't make sense to add in story elements when there's already a main story mode available. The subgame extra modes are, you know, extra. It's weird how Kumazaki got asked a story question about canonosity, mentions how the what if scenario is for those who want to dive deeper into the game world, then later says that you can't really consider everything to be connected. That isn't confusing at all. What HAL Labs should have done instead is incorporate Galactonite into the main mode of the story, but no, they want to give players a good reason for playing the other modes. Let's keep using the same surprise again and again. That will never get old, right? Kirby's Superstar Ultra. A subgame boss. Kirby's Return to Dreamland. A boss rush boss. Kirby Planet Robobot. A subgame boss. And Super Kirby Clash. A fluster cuck of a game. Super Kirby Clash is the final evolution of Team Kirby Clash, a subgame introduced in Kirby Planet Robobot. That subgame evolved into its own 3DS eShop game in 2017. Take Kirby's Cash Deluxe. Uh, I, I mean Team Kirby Clash Deluxe. Two years later, moving on to the Nintendo Switch eShop game, Super Kirby Clash. If you've played previous Kirby games, you may notice that this powerful character looks a bit familiar. For his design, we wanted him to have a different effect, but the designer also wanted this character's armor to look heroic and reminiscent of his days as a champion. Due to this character's special appearance, the game director, Yumi Tadu, requested that he not have a clear name. Instead, we was given the name the Eon Hero, which sounds more like his title. We used a similar tactic when naming King D Mind. Oh, that's right! He's called Eon Hero, and not Galactonite. Why? Because the game director requested it for his special appearance on the Super Kirby Clash channel. We all know that's Galactonite, you're not fooling anybody. Not only does Super Kirby Clash have recolored bosses of recolors running all over the place, 
But this game also takes place long, long ago in a faraway realm, the Dream Kingdom. It's safe to say Super Kirby Clash is not canon since it clashes with everything else. The more I hear this guy getting called the greatest warrior in the galaxy, the less I believe it. This dude has zero W's across the board, but it doesn't really matter because this guy isn't canon. Huh. I'm... I'm looking at my notes here and there were five games where Galactonite appeared. Must have missed one. In Kirby Star Allies, Galactonite is once again a sub-game bot. Huh? What the heck? <laughs> Enter Morpho Knight, the new surprise boss of the Kirby series. Its first appearance being in Kirby Star Allies after getting faked out by a Galactonite boss fight. Just like Galactonite, we know next to nothing about this character. So let's get in touch with Mr. Pause Screen Lore Guy. On the Day of Judgment, this fluttery fiend will fly into action. Brought into existence by the greatest warrior in the galaxy and reborn as a knight of doom through years of adversity, now begins an epic battle with a pure being twisted by a dark past. Well, that was extremely vague. I'm not really surprised because this is Kirby after all and how Labs is allergic to elaboration. Moving on. But Meta! You didn't read the Morpho Knight EX pause screen description! Oh, you mean the boss rush one? Alright, let's read it. Come Judgment Day, this fluttery fiend will fly into action. Will it land in a dream world, or a nightmare? It has mastered its new abilities, now all will witness its true power. Once again, extremely vague! Moving on! But Meta, you haven't read the Japanese version of the pause screen descriptions! Do it now! What are you, an anime purist? Why do I have to read another language? I don't even know! I can't speak for other languages other than English, but when it comes to the English translations for Mapaz Lore, the official translators did a terrible job by either removing information or altering it. Remember earlier when I said the classic question, Have you played the Kirby games? is a loaded question. At this point in time, it means, Have you played the Kirby games? Have you read over 100 different posts on a dead application called Miiverse? Have you read all 256 figurine descriptions? Have you read all the boss pause screen descriptions? And have you read those same pause screens in Japanese? Let's just read the fan translation already. On the Day of Judgment comes the paradisaical butterfly from another dimension. Which dimension will it surround next, a dream world or the land of the dead? It has amplified each day the power inherited from the White Knight and has finally made that power its own. Now, judgment day for the Black Paradisaical Butterfly to demonstrate its true power has come. Well, that's unfortunate. Morpho Knight over here is 0 for 3. The Japanese pause screen version does name drop a location we've heard of before. Another dimension was introduced in Kirby's Return to Dreamland, where its name is so much on the nose, it's confusing to get a grasp on where it is and what's going on with it. Hal Labs fumbled the ball immediately with this one. Hal Kandra is located inside another dimension for level 6 and level 7, but it also isn't located inside another dimension because level 8 is called another dimension. Hal Labs sure is consistent at handling other dimensions, aren't they? The pause screen description also mentions power from the White Knight. Morpho Knight is leeching power off the non-canon character in a non-canon mode? These three pause screens are completely irrelevant to us. It looks like history is bound to repeat itself once again. Kirby in the Forgotten Land would beg to differ. Back when Forgotten Land was the talk of the town, a lot of fans were going crazy screaming Morpho Knight is now canon. Morpho Knight was in a dream world where Kirby must go through old level design again while also fighting more deviant art bosses he's already thwarted. All of this screamed another side mode subgame. However, after beating the final boss, Fecto Elphilis, Liangar, who was possessed, never returned after the climactic conflict. His soul was smashed into fragments and scattered across the isolated aisles. How Labs decided to make a post-game that follows the ending of the game, which makes it canon. Because Morpho Knight doesn't say a single word, let's hit up Mr. Pause Screen Lore Guy for some figurine description. The fluttering fiend that casts judgment upon final battles is drawn toward the isolated isles of Forgo Dreams. 
There, it feasts on the most powerful soul it finds and takes the fearsome form of a scarlet-clad knight. Let the most challenging battle of the new world begin. Can I get an O for 4? Well, to be more accurate, this is a O for 1. Because the Morpho Knight events with star allies aren't canon. And here is where the loud Kirby fans come in. Awesome Kirby fact. One of the most interesting things in Forgotten Land is the canon appearance of Morpho Knight. Morpho Knight had been largely agreed upon as being a Grim Reaper of sorts, with him consuming Galacta Knight in Star Allies, and IDF 86 in Forgotten Land. How can you be a gimmick account about Kirby facts, then later say, largely agreed upon, as being a Grim Reaper? That's not a fact. Morpho Knight is never referred as such. And then are treating the consumption of Galacta Knight as canon when it isn't. Guys, guys, he's finally canon! Oh wait, he has nothing substantial in his lore, so let's start looking for scraps! However, this game has made me think, especially with this description, that he's more like his novel characterization than previously thought. There, it feasts on the most powerful soul it finds and takes the fearsome form of a scarlet-clad knight. In the novel, Morpho Knight is described as the Knight of Hades, and he waits in Hades until he hears a powerful being let out a death scream. He then goes to the being and consumes them, absorbing their powers and adding them onto his. Nah, uh uh what do you think you're doing? Are you guys using... <gasps> another Kirby media source to push your Morpho Knight lore agenda? Oh, I'm sorry to tell you, but these Japanese light novels aren't canon. All of this is ironic because these loud Kirby fans will also get angry when others try to use that dang Kirby anime for canonosity. The fourth part of this Twitter thread is comparing boss fights from both games, and then we get to the end of this Morpho Knight thread. Lastly, Chaos Alpha Lee's surviving Moroho Knight encounter absorbing his power instead and becoming more powerful in the process, being born of Chaos, leading me to believe that Morpho is a neutral being. I'm really excited for more Morpho Knight appearances in the future smile. The fluttering Dream Eater can't even do its own job properly, because later in the game, you have Chaos Elphilis using Morpho Knight's power, the one who was supposed to be eaten. Whoa, guys, where did Morpho Knight go? Surely when Kirby and friends ever run into it again, they better be ready to fight and take it out and not let it roam free, right? And I sure hope Morpho Knight doesn't get added into any sort of remake, because that would do more harm than good for Kirby's already poor storytelling. And here we are, the third and final section of the video. I hope you brought your floaties, because we're in deep waters now. Guy who gets very passionate about the lore for a franchise that isn't intended to have deep lore. Kirby fans. Wow, somebody can actually get behind this time. You're completely right. They look way too deep into things. Mind you, the Kirby lore is extremely deep, but something tells me people weren't supposed to find out. Huh? This post pretty much sums up what I love about Kirby and the deep lore of the series. I love the storytelling in the Kirby games because of the ever-present implication that something extremely significant is going on in the background of Kirby's peaceful life on Popstar. Like, in the Kirby universe there's this massive war between technology and magic and gigantic space demons with cat faces and you don't get to learn anything significant about it. <laughs> Oh, man. That last sentence sends me every time. Kirby's lore is so deep, the interesting events that are happening in the Kirby world, universe, galaxy, are happening somewhere else that we players don't get to experience. There was a mention of science and magic groups, so let's talk about the ancients. In Kirby's Return to Dreamland, after collecting all the energy spheres, Magalore tells Kirby and friends that the Lore Starcutter is a legendary Halkandran vessel crafted by the Ancients with an incredible power. Said incredible power gave rise to clockwork stars and items that can bring dreams to life, a lot of countless other creations, such as the Master Crown that lets you rule the universe. We're only told about the items they left behind. In Kirby Star Allies, after defeating the leader of the Mage Sisters at the Jamba Heart Altar, the cult leader Highness isn't too thrilled and starts spazzing out, talking about how his people were responsible for stopping a galactic crisis of magic. And because of those actions, some other group of science sealed away and banished Highness's people to the edge of the galaxy. It's payback time now! Screw all of you! Going to release the big bad void Termina from its heart-shaped shackle at any costs. 
What I would love to know aside from knowing who these people are, is how a group of magic users managed to get sealed away by a group of science andies. Did they get jumped when they were low on MP? Did they bash a bunch of flasks on their heads? Just like in other dimension, calling these unknown beings the ancients is too much on the nose where it gets confusing. The word ancient can mean of a time long past, or very old. Why would they call themselves the ancients in their own present time? There must have been a race for them to identify themselves as. The Kirby series has made no effort on establishing how long anything happens. Anytime the word ancient or civilization gets brought up in a game, how Lab's elaboration analogies start acting up again, and they just leave us with speculation. What we have left are a few characters who should know more about the so-called Ancients. There is President Heltman from Kirby Planet Robobot who managed to get his corporate hands on a Nova. Don't think we'll be learning where or how he managed to do that because he's dead! There's both Magalore and Highness who've already told Kirby and friends what we know of already, unless they're just hiding more information from us. And then there's the Four-Headed Dragon. In Kirby's Return to Dreamland, when Magalore crashed onto Planet Popstar, he was attacked by Landia, because he stole the Lore Star Cutter and attempted to steal the Master Crown as well. Landia was in charge of protecting these treasures since the ancient times. If Landia was alive that long, surely they would have a bigger role in the Kirby series of deep lore, right? Instead, Hal Labs is using the dragon as spin-off boss fodder. Incredible! In Kirby in the Forgotten Land, Kirby gets sucked through a giant vortex that opened in the skies of Popstar. It strands Kirby to a deserted new world where a long lost civilization used to live. How Labs nailed the aesthetic world building for this new world. It's not just your basic abandoned city shopping center. Aside from that aspect, How Labs has their storytelling priorities backwards. Throughout the game, you can see signs and writings all over the world made up by a secret language with secret ancient text how Labs came up with. That's cool and all, but I'm sure the actual people who lived in this unnamed new world is more important to learn about. The Kirby community has their ideas on who these unnamed people may be. Humans. If anything, Forgotten Land amplified the idea of these ancient civilizations being humans. I don't blame people for coming to that conclusion, but these ancients being humans is never confirmed, and causes quite a few problems which we'll be getting into now. Even before 2022, with the hint of the ancients, you'd have people pointing out that Shiver Star is a frozen planet Earth. In Kirby and the Forgotten Land, you have areas that look quite like structures on Earth, whether it be malls or cities. That's two planets that could be Earth. But what if I told you, Earth already exists? In Kirby's Adventures Instruction Manual, the first sentence for the story says this. Light years away on a tiny star not visible from Earth is the magical, peaceful place known as Dreamland. Second game in the franchise, by the way. If Shiver Star or the New World is Earth, why not just call it Earth? If humans do play a big role in the Kirby series, then what's going on with Adeline? Shouldn't she play a bigger role in these stories? We don't even know where she's from either. I do have a bit more to say about the Ancients, but I'll save that for a little bit later. Kirby fan, the little bits of lore and world building hidden in Kirby games is really neat smile. Some creature emerging from the lagoon. Actually, it's not the deep. Have you ever played Final Fantasy? Try reading some Nietzsche. Let's talk about headcanons. A headcanon is essentially fan fiction of fiction. My own example would be Piranha Plant from Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Because Waluigi never made it into Smash as a playable character, Piranha Plant is Waluigi's dual mode partner from Mario Party 3, aka the best Mario Party, fighting in his stead. This is not confirmed or doesn't happen in Smash Ultimate. In a vacuum, headcanons for fiction are perfectly fine. They become a problem when fans are using headcanons as actual canon and peddling that information to others. This idea gets amplified with the loud Kirby fans that it becomes community gaslighting. We've already experienced that earlier with Morphonite. Morphonite had been largely agreed upon to be a Grim Reaper of sorts. That headcanon for the game sounds the best for Forgotten Land, so let's roll with that. 
Remember the loaded question of, have you played the Kirby games? Because they're trying to hit you with a gotcha when it comes to Kirby lore? That question ultimately means, have you played the Kirby games? Have you read over 100 different Miiverse posts on a dead application? Have you read all 256 figurine descriptions? Have you read all the boss pause screens? And have you read those same pause screens in Japanese? Oh, and believe my personal headcanon too. From an outsider's perspective, it's intimidating to go against or even question them because you're at risk of getting stampeded by a herd of Kirby-themed username and avatars who most definitely dive in the Wikipedia wells much more than you, regardless if you play the game or not. Unfortunately for the loud Kirby fans, I'm not on their team for this one, even though I clearly fit the bill. It's heavily implied that I'm going against their status quo. That's another thing to look out for whenever you're interacting or spectating the Kirby community when it comes to social media discussion and especially the Kirby lore video YouTubers. Though moving on to the corrupted Ripple Star, after defeating Miracle Matter and expunging the planet of all dark matter, the Dark Star reveals itself with a familiar face at its core. But hold up a minute, wasn't Zero destroyed in Kirby's Dreamland 3? Well, kind. In the case of 64, it's heavily implied Zero was revived using the body that was cast away towards the end of its first fight. So after yet another mildly disturbing battle in a game made for kids, Dark Matter was once again supposedly defeated, never to return again. At least for another game or two. If you hear the word implied, you can basically ignore what comes afterwards. They're on the speculation, theory, fanfiction tightrope, where what they're saying isn't fact because how Labs is too busy trolling their player base by hiding secret obscure howl rooms in the most obnoxious ways possible. The loud Kirby fans are always starving for lore content, which is quite funny since this franchise is supposed to have deep lore, meaning they should be well fed. Because of their malnourishment, they forget what cameos, easter eggs, and references are, and they just think all of the above is lore. Kirby lore haters when Kumazaki reveals Mr. TikTok enjoys a bit of Wensleydale in the evening via the Funko Tie and merch line instead of in a voice line of dialogue in the opening cutscene of the newest mainland game. Looks like this user's targeting the Kirby lore haters and taking licks at their fury. I wonder what the catalyst of this tweet was. The day before, the spin-off game Kirby's Dream Buffet was released. When playing online, any CPUs in a race will be assigned a random name from a random pool of pre-made names. So Kirby's Dream Buffet doesn't have lore. Or does it? One of the bot names is Q-Geronia. The Japanese bot name for that is Taranza and Joronia. Duranza and Geronia, is this freaking Queen Sectonia's original name? OP later said in the thread that they were asking a question, not confirming it to be Sectonia's original name, while also saying that the name was out of place from the rest. You have the Kirby Lore bootlickers acting like a hot new lore album just dropped, and you have the Kirby Lore haters who detest Howlav's methods of revealing their lore. I'm going to be real. As much as I love Kirby, I've always hated how story and lore is told. I feel like it's always in the most obnoxious places where you have to travel to a completely irrelevant place to get it. I just go by what a story says and don't look further. Then you will get pissed off at KH even more. I love this defense. Instead of eating sand, you could be eating mud. While it can be just a Kirby skin, I personally think Meta Knight on Dream Buffet is 100% possible on canon because Kirby Cafe lore exists. I remember reading on somewhere that Meta Knight canonically has a sweet tooth. I think I did too. Though I don't remember where. Unless we have some sort of scenario in a future game where Zero Cubed appears and tries to persuade Meta Knight to join the dark side with his favorite sweets, I fail to see why that matters if it's canon. In the Return to Dreamland trailer, Terry and Alphalin book. Alphalin fans stay winning. What does this mean? Oh lordy do I smell more law implications? This also means more law. I know it's probably just a way to reference Alphalin, but I will scream if this has law implications. Magalore's Tome Tracker is a brand new subgame. You know, not story mode. You wouldn't want lore implications here, trust me. That would cause more story problems than Kirby already has. In late September of 2022, a Kirby encyclopedia was released in Japan, which contains detailed profiles of over 1,000 characters in the Kirby franchise. A Twitter user was able to get their hands on the character encyclopedia book because it's Japan only. In a now deleted tweet, it says, Welp, it's official. Bandy is not the Waddle Dee from 64, and Adeline and Addo are totally different people. Addo is a boss from Kirby's Dreamland 3 who looks awfully familiar to another character we know. 
all the lore librarians pulled up in a baby rage. Because why would Hell Labs do this? Grah! This goes against my head canning! I don't like it, so I'm going to ignore it! You even have people trying to shoot down the messenger who has no affiliations of Hell Labs whatsoever over a page in an encyclopedia about a little girl. OMG, I just found out if you steal Meta Knight's sword in his fight, he gets out his old one, Kirby's Adventure. Same design. Okay, as a Meta Knight enjoyer, this reference is super cool. The fact that there is actual lore applications to this is funny. The word lore in this community just continues to lose meaning. There's no lore to this. The weapon Meta Knight uses is only ever called Meta Knight Sword, Galaxia, or Master. Huh? I can tell you where Meta Knight Sword lore happens in the anime. But wait, is the anime canon to the video games? Are those Waddle Dees carrying spears like in the anime? Is that Castle DDD from the anime? Is that the teleport of enemy in the background from the anime? Macho DDD and Devil Kirby? Is that Octagon? Are those more characters from Kirby right back at ya? Super Mario? Is that you? The Kirby anime in the Super Mario Bros. series is now canon to the Kirby lore! Wowee! On August 11th, 2022, the Kirby 30th Anniversary Music Festival took place at the Tokyo Garden Theater and was live-streamed worldwide. A musical celebration for the Big 30. Then you got people online saying that there was lore. In a music concert! Unfortunately, I didn't watch this concert live because it was on at 3 in the morning and I just can't pull all-nighters whenever I want anymore. Even if I did watch it, I don't speak Japanese. So I took my search to Twitter for answers. There was a Twitter user talking about the Kirby concert in a thread and even quoting about it. I wanted to know more, so I asked them where they got their information from, and was met with radio silence. Let's go find somebody else. Oh by the way for anyone who missed it, the Kirby concert this morning did indeed include important lore in case you thought they wouldn't do something like that. Care to explain it if it was important lore? Basically during the concert, we got a look at the in-game character who sings a new world in the lore. They were a human which further implies the Forgotten Land was home to humans. I'll confirm that. I mean I don't understand Japanese but based on what I saw, context clues, and the little bit of English, yeah that's what seemed to be the case. That doesn't sound like a HAL confirmation. They've had lore in Miiverse posts, so in an official HAL concert sounds like confirmation to me. But I'm not going off based on what you saw, especially since you don't know Japanese. If HAL did make a Miiverse post about it, can you link it? Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up! I never heard from them again. Maybe they're on vacation or something and forgot to link it to me. Eh, who knows? I eventually found the answer I was looking for that caught quite a bit of traction in the Kirby community. Before I show the tweets, I want to make it extra clear that joking around, having fun with a character role, or even roleplay about a character, isn't an issue that I have because it should be harmless fun. My read of Nacial's performance in the hashtag Kirby30DHFest is that that's her right there. This is Laura and that is her canon. In universe appearance. The new world is Earth, its inhabitants were humans, and this is more evidence. Kirby's world and lore has expanded onto her own. That's what I've been saying. This is the best proof that humans were indeed the inhabitants of the Forgotten Land, not some wacky species so this concert is canon. Wait. Wait so you're telling me she's real? I was a bit confused why everyone kept saying nature is real but now I understand. I knew IT. The ancients were human. This means Eidoline must be a descendant. So the Kirby Music Fest of all things confirmed it was humans in the new world what the fuck is Shiver Star supposed to be then? Unless they started on Shiver Star and then went to the New World. In which case that means the Ancients planet hopped three times. Wait so the singer is a canon Kirby character? Yes. If your specific reasoning for believing the civilization are humans because this real person making a real life performance at a video game concert is a real character to the Kirby fiction canon, you're severely lacking in vitamin D and it's time to go outside. Oh man, those street performers at the New York launch for Super Mario Odyssey must be the real canon residents of New Donk City, with real-life Mario joining the sun and dance! Woohoo! This Mario lore kinda going crazy! Then you got the creatures emerging from the lagoon, telling these people who have gone off the deep end that they're reading too much into things. Which brings the classic defense of criticism and reaching being, We're just having fun! Let people enjoy things! 
Oh, really? My bad. Now what happens if I flip the script, turn the tables, and send that right back at you? <laughs> hey guys, Kirby murders millions for cake, Meta Knight bad guy, DDD also bad guy, Adeline is an addo, Susie is beep boop 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 robot girl, Poyo 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 Poyo, I'm a clobber like that guy! <laughs> hey stop gatekeeping the series, please! Out of all the Nintendo franchises to gatekeep, they choose the one that's known for being easy and accessible for everyone. Um, Meta, did you just call Kirby a Nintendo franchise? How dare you! How Laboratory makes the games! Oh, don't worry, I know. The developers absolutely deserve to get credit for developing a game, whether it be good or bad. It's not like every time you turn on a Kirby video game, you're greeted by a dog with eggs laying on a nest saying HAL Laboratory. That's why at the beginning of this video, I mentioned Second Party. Although HAL Labs is their own group, they're exclusively making games for Nintendo using their characters. These Kirby fans are so quick to pounce on others about their unforgivable mistake, they make themselves look very bad. Mario and Luigi are now Alpha Dream characters. Pikachu is a Game Freak character. And Prince Marth is an Intelligent Systems character. Doesn't roll off the tongue that well, huh? I'm starting to wonder if how Labs hired these loud Kirby fans as their personal hitmen anytime there's misconceptions, critiques, or slander to their beloved franchise. Which brings us to two YouTubers I want to talk about, Demich and Arlo. A few months ago, Demich made a video review on the latest Kirby game titled, Kirby in the Forgotten Land is the best game Nintendo has ever made. The loud Kirby fans were not happy with that title. I wonder if this actually a fair and solid analysis of Kirby Forgotten Land and how it holds up when compared to the rest of the vast library of games which Nintendo has published, or if it's just this game didn't have free updates so it wins by default. You wonder? Maybe go watch the video! I know I have, and he talks about how great the game is. But no! The YouTuber confused Haru Nintendo! No, this is horrible! During the summertime, Arlo made a first impressions video on the newly announced Kirby game, Kirby's Dream Buffet. Huh? He got clipped? Let's go watch it. Kirby fan, but I can still be jokingly annoyed i could be half annoyed that kirby fans get everything forever always seriously it's like he's the real mascot we just got a game now we're getting another game that's two mainline games and i don't even know how many spin-offs in five years that's amazing congratulations kirby fans you get everything. For God's sake, please somebody tell this man what studios are. My brother in Christ Nintendo doesn't make Kirby games, it's fucking hell that does everything. I like Arlo and his content, but come on. Hal develops Kirby games, not Nintendo. Kirby doesn't have some kind of bias within Nintendo that's keeping other franchises from getting games. Someone should explain to him that Nintendo doesn't develop Kirby games. God forbid Hal Labs actually wanting to please their fanbase, right? Truth be told, I don't want to have anything against Arlo, but good God. Kirby is not in-house Nintendo franchise. It's developed by Hal Labs. That developed Kirby games and some smaller puzzle games on the side. They don't work on Metroid or Pikmin. Arlo doesn't even make the studio's argument Twitter is talking about. They also conveniently cut out the 8 seconds before that clip where Arlo mentions how much he enjoyed Forgotten Land and likes Kirby a lot more now. Maybe these guys should just, I don't know, watch the actual video. They also jumped Arlo because of his thumbnail. In a game about eating the most strawberries from biggest to smallest, we have Kirby fans, Metroid fans, and Pikmin fans. The joke here is that Kirby fans are eating the most because they're getting the most games, and Pikmin fans are eating the least because they're getting the least games. Are you forgetting that other than Star Allies and Forgotten Land, all the other Kirby games are simply minigames you get for really cheap at the eShop? The idea of complaining about this is so unnecessary. Now Hal is being antagonized for using their main series. The Kirby police continue to get their licks in on Arlo because of... I can't believe he called Dream Buffet a mainline game! It's obviously a spin-off game! Star Allies is within the five-year time frame he mentioned. Leave it to the loud Kirby fans to get mad at YouTubers for complimenting and enjoying the franchise they love. The classic Twitter brain rut. You all look like absolute morons right now.
Because Kirby doesn't have deep lore, the loud Kirby fans become cheerleaders gassing up their boy, Hal Labs. We'll be going over some common tactics that are used in order to persuade others. They lock in on your emotions, shock value, or try to overprocess your brain. Just because Hal Labs rams several paragraphs into their video games doesn't mean the lore is deep. In fact, a lot of it is gibberish. Here is a meme where the book of actual Kirby lore is huge compared to the book on the right because the games don't provide anything. Another user mentions that Kirby lore isn't deep, then proceeds to get ratioed by a third user who is a Kirby fan, briefly summarizing events that happened in the Kirby games. He's been real quiet since you tweeted all of this. TBH I don't blame him. I hope it didn't seem like I was just ganging up on him or something, just that saying Kirby has no lore is very blatantly wrong. Well, they were not blatantly wrong, because they never said Kirby has no lore. They just said the lore isn't deep. This is a tactic the loud Kirby fans will do. I could dump my giant wall of text, or my giant essay, or talk about the Kirby series for hours. Congratulations, you're very passionate about the franchise you love. That's great, but just because you can say a lot about the topic doesn't make the lore deep. If you had to explain the Kirby franchise without using your own headcanons, implications, theories, and non-canon content, you all wouldn't last long because the lore is held together with silly string. In fact, here's a visual example of that. Kirby lore update. Forgotten land edition. You can type Kirby lore on Google Images and you'll find more of these. Not only are these charts messy, they all run their own agenda, and will occasionally have question marks to their connections. If I grab a bunch of Kirby renders and post arrows everywhere, this will show everyone how complex the Kirby lore is. Scary does not automatically equal deep. Morpho Knight is the butterfly you've seen return to Dreamland, Triple Deluxe, Planet Robobot, Star Allies, and the Forgotten Land. Although it's made its appearance a handful of times, it doesn't do anything, except for appearing in one non-canon boss fight and one canon boss fight. The surprise factor for this character has been depleted, and you'll still have Kirby fans pissing their pants anytime they see a butterfly. <laughs> They act like the Kirby series is part of the video game horror genre, when it's not. If you show a loud Kirby fan a paper cut you got in your finger, they might wake up the other side of the planet with their screams because they saw a drop of blood. Here is where fan art, memes, and edits come in. In a vacuum, just like headcanons, fan art for fiction is perfectly fine. They become a problem when you're using it as a substitute for the content that's in the games. Kirby gameplay versus Kirby lore. In the Kirby lore fan cam, you have edited renders and horror fan art that are never shown that way, ever, in the games. Some YouTubers covering Kirby lore content will also do the same by either putting those horror fan arts either in their videos, or the thumbnail to hammer home just how spooky Kirby can really get. The region doesn't stop there either. For the people that think that it's insane Kirby goes this deep, the current director of the series, Shin Yakumazaki, made eldritch horror artwork in his free time, sometimes even drawing Kirby characters in this style. He does this all on purpose while dropping lore details in-game. I know I'm late to this, but last night I found out Shinya Kumazaki, director of the Kirby games, draws eldritch horror pieces. It's terrifying and explains a lot. Okay, the art is spectacular, but I guess that explains a lot of why Kirby lore is the way it is. It explains a lot, huh? Now tell me, do these images of eldritch horrors ever appear in the Kirby games? No, they don't! Then why not show the actual eldritch horrors? Oh that's right, because these official bosses are Mickey Mouse levels of terror. Not sure how a baby could like this, but go off I guess. They're beating your ass in the court retweets. Dark does not automatically equal deep. The Kirby community gets dragged anytime Dark Nintendo games get mentioned, probably because they exaggerate everything to make their beloved franchise look better. The number one way they convince others is by using the pause screen. Rise, O oh Dark Lord of Despair. Crush, Crush the, the stars, stars lay waste, waste to care. care. Rise and cover the land in sorrows. May your symphony of emptiness bring the end of all tomorrows. Rise, O oh Dark Lord of Despair! Crush the stars, lay waste to care! Upon your wing, dark judgment bring! May your symphony of tragedy cause the end of everything! Void! Turn! 
Hey, is my copy of Kirby Star Allies glitched? I don't remember that cutscene ever taking place when I played the game. Kirby fans when the game gives a random paragraph of implied shit that happened off screen, we didn't feel like having a good story on screen. Kirby slander? Not on my watch. I mean, dark doesn't equal heavy core. Haltman souls screaming while Kirby kills the Nova Star is pretty dark in my opinion. Honestly I barely heard those screams. It was only present in the X-Boss fight. If I got a dollar for any time somebody uses a non-canon pause screen to push their lore agenda on social media or on a Kirby lore video, I would have multiple dollars. They rarely use the actual story mode pause screens because they provide next to nothing which is why I said gibberish earlier. I don't know man this shit seems kind of fucked up. I pause screens. So dark. Listen I love Kirby with all of my heart but this isn't dark, unless you are like hate. You can literally hear Haltman's screams of pain as Kirby destroys the core of Star Dream. You don't think that's at least a little bit morbid? It is a bit morbid when somebody's getting beaten up or murdered as they're howling in pain. As dark as the Kirby games try to be, they fall flat because of its 11th hour storytelling. Timing and investment are very crucial to leave an impact. Some of these endgame characters do have tragic pasts, but because of pause screen and Miiverse shenanigans, you don't get to learn about everything in that moment. It's very hard to care about characters we only meet for 5 minutes, because as the player, you don't get time to bond or learn about them. Whether they are a hero or a villain, if they don't kick the bucket and die, there's a big chance Hal doesn't use the character again and moves on to the next Kirby game. Even as a Kirby veteran, it gets more difficult to feel any form of sorrow from these tragic storylines because Hal Labs keeps doing the same thing. CMP, Kirby 64, The Queen Gets Possessed, Kirby Squeak Squad, The Roach Gets Possessed, Kirby's Return to Dreamland, Magalor gets possessed, Kirby's Triple Deluxe, Sectonia gets corrupted, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, Klacia gets possessed, Kirby Planet Robobot, President Haltman gets possessed, Kirby Star Allies, the Jamba Heart, aka the plot device that corrupts others, even the Mage Sisters get puppeteered with Highness using them as ragdolls, Kirby in the Forgotten Land, Leongar gets possessed, all of that, plus our mainstay characters Meta Knight and especially King DVD. Hello my terrific friends, Arlo here, and today I'm reviewing... Kirby Star Allies. Now, now, I know I've got a lot of Kirby fans watching my videos, and they get super mad at me whenever I say something bad about Kirby, so that's why you're really gonna enjoy this review. Let's get started. Kirby Star Allies is easily the best game in the Switch's library, and an objectively perfect game. And, uh... D there isn't even anything else to say about it. I give Kirby Star Allies a perfect score, 7 out of 7. Well, thanks for watching. That was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed making that one. And if you're a Kirby fan, you can just turn off the video now, because it's over. There there there's nothing left but one really, really long end crawl. See you later! When it comes to public reception of the 2018 game Kirby Star Allies, it's not very positive. Some would say it was underwhelming, mediocre, or even unfinished. Because that game is always catching strays, you'll have Kirby fans highlighting the boatload of lore the game has and how hard the lore goes. I've already talked about some aspects of Kirby Star Allies lore, but I haven't properly addressed the giant elephant in the room, the final boss, Void Termina. It's ironic how the loud Kirby fans get on people for spreading misinformation and misconceptions about the franchise when they do it themselves. They'll say Kirby is a god, a god of destruction, and some will even go to the lengths and say he's a reincarnated god. You even have a YouTuber giving Void Termina extra appendages on a thumbnail to push the similarities to Kirby. And it is undoubtable. Void is dark matter. Dark matter is Kirby. Void is Kirby. A Kirby born of hatred and suffering instead of friendship and joy. Kirby himself is a destructive god who forsook his violent appetite in favor of peace, happiness, and bonds with others. Undoubtable, huh? Now let's get into why Kirby isn't a god, and neither is Void Termina. In the boss pause screen descriptions in every phase of Void Termina that takes place in the story mode, none of them mention how Void Termina is a god or that it's related to Kirby. In the sub-mode boss pause screens that people like to use for confirmation that Void Termina and Kirby are gods are non-canon. The splash screen before you start the fight calls it a destroyer of worlds. 
I already know some Kirby fans will point out to me that in other languages of the game, Void Termina is referred to as a God of Destruction, something you would only know if you did your research on it or happened to play the game in those languages. If we go back to the 2018 Nintendo Dream interview, Mr. Kumazaki himself says something these Kirby lore Andes might not be too thrilled with. In this game, the Destruction God, Void Termina, stands in the way as the final boss. First of all, please tell us about the existence of the Destruction God itself. First of all, is it okay to have a real god like being in the Kirby series? I was very worried about that part. So instead of making a specific god, I decided to make it a being that is mysterious and transcending. Highness called Void Term in a Destruction God, see note, but it is not clear whether he is a god or not. Void Termina himself did not say I am a god, but rather it was Highness that believed that Void Termina was a god. And there you have it! Void Termina is not a god, therefore Kirby is not a god either. Here's where I would say GG easy clap and move on to the next point, but I'm sure some lore librarians out there would argue about this to the bitter end, and I'm down to far more content on this god topic. So let's talk hypotheticals. For argument's sake, let's say Void Termina is a god, and Kirby is a reincarnated god from it. I'll be going over common arguments the community uses to push that agenda, and in the grand scope of everything, why that idea isn't as mind-blowing as you may think in the Kirby franchise. The non-canon pause screens. Void Termina was sealed away by the four heroes of yore. We don't know who any of them are. However, people believe that the non-canon character Galactonite was one of them. Why, you might ask? Because the Jamba Heart was sealed with four spears of heart, of course. In Super Kirby Clash, he uses a heart spear barrage attack. Aside from this character not existing in canon, if HAL Labs didn't reuse attacks and moves so frequently throughout multiple games in this franchise, this point would have some form of merit to it. That's like saying Kin Dedede and Wispy Woods are both Kirby's because they all have an air bullet attack. Oh no guys, the final boss used the Arc Boomerang Cutter attack just like other bosses in the series. They're obviously all connected to each other. Recycling. So very deep. The pause screen also mentions ancient scrolls that just knows this information about Void Termina, but we never know where it originated from. In this pause screen, it talks about how Void exists in all dimensions, but his shining form in another dimension inspired the ancients to transcribe his mysteries and sacred texts. Pause lore guy then asks what will be written next and starts talking about new scrolls. What do you mean by written next and new scrolls? Are the ancients alive right now, or did you not read all the scrolls yet. What are you talking about? Clearly, Mr. Paws Green Lore Guy over here doesn't know what's happening either. This is a popular paragraph the lore librarians will flash at you that starts with no telling if it's true. But according to the ancient scrolls, Void Termina may rise again in other forms depending on whether positive or negative energy is gathered. It seems this being of darkness will wander the galaxy one day. He is reborn into a new existence. When he returns, hopefully it will be as a friend. However, people will act like this is true. A friend doesn't mean it's going to be another Kirby. The biggest reason people believe Void Termina is Kirby, because it copies Kirby's face in the later phases. You know, the shape-shifting boss. Then that would mean Meta Knight has to be a Void Termina too, because he looks like Kirby with that logic. You'll have fans stating that Void Termina is a part of the Dark Matter species with all these blatant references to Dreamland 3 and Kirby 64 Matter fights. If that's the case, Gooey would have a much more concrete relationship with Void Termina than Kirby, because Gooey is canonically made from the same stuff as Dark Matter, unlike Kirby. Then why does Void Termina never mimic Gooey's face? In fact, if Dark Matter in general is so important to the Kirby lore, why is this guy normally absent? Well, good thing he's playable in Kirby Star Allies after a free DLC update of the game. Let's check out his pause screen description. My name? Gooey? Maybe? This googly-eyed wonder from Kirby's Dream Land 3 comes in search of answers to the big questions in life. Who am I? Where? What time is it? Thanks, Mr. Pause Screen Lore Guy. You've been so insightful for fueling the Kirby lore with all this depth. You've been incredible. No, I'm just kidding. You're actually a trash bin. Fans will just associate both Kirby and Gooey to be formed by positive energy of Void Termina. There's a problem with that. Assuming that is true, 
How would Kirby and Gooey be created when Void Termina has been sealed away for who knows how long? Either Kirby or Gooey have an age, and Kirby gets referred to as a spry little boy, so he would be on the younger side. In Dreamland 2, before you ever come across Dark Matter in the finale, you can find Gooey emerging from protective bags. So positively kicking a Dark Matter's ass won't just reincarnate some new Gooey on the spot. People will try connecting Kirby to Void Termina because he smiles as he dies. You guys are reaching more than Midman players. Kirby's not smiling when he gets a game over unless you're trying to say he transforms into Dark Matter or something when he dies. Fans love to bring up that Kirby is Void Termina because Green Greens is playing as a light motif or a remix in the fight. This point is trash because HAL Labs makes new arrangements and remixes their songs all the time, especially Green Greens. Another point that gets brought up is that Shinya Kumazaki voices Void Termina. If Void Termina and Kirby are one, why not get Kirby's actual voice actor to do it? When you beat the Soul Melter EX difficulty on the ultimate choice, you unlock the Dream button, which lets you swap to a classic Kirby, his original design, minus the white. Some of these lore andies will go through some headcanon gymnastics and say that the classic Kirby is a reincarnated Void that's beaten up in Soul Melter EX, which is never confirmed by the way. It's literally just a cost in a Kirby game that is hard celebrating the franchise if you haven't noticed, it's not that deep. And even if it were true, Void Termina isn't all that special. What if I told you there's more than one Kirby that already exists? Dark Meta Knight slash Kirby into four separate Kirbys in a maze mirror. At the end of the game, they never become whole again. In fact, they just all go their separate ways. So there's three other Kirbys running around somewhere, granting a total of four. In Kirby's Dream Course, there's a yellow Kirby called Kibi which makes five. Then you have Kirby Battle Royale, which introduced quite the invention that DDD keeps in his attic or something. The Kirby Printer. A printer that spits out Kirby copies. Good as the original, or maybe better. Talk about a weapon of mass destruction. It does get destroyed at the end of the game though, but DDD was basically handing out Kirby's like Halloween candy. There is yet another pause screen that these loud Kirby fans want to make sure you don't miss, where English localization messed up yet again by excluding lore information. Dreams. Darkness, soul, heart. All chaos and possibilities assemble within its substance, being born as the original and ancestor of all. Would that mean everyone and everything in the Kirby universe is a god? Or does that line somehow mean just Kirby is a god and everyone else isn't? The last pause screen takes the strawberry shortcake. The final battle at hand, Voy takes his first steps toward a new age. In place of tyrannical rage, will he find nap time, gentle breezes, treats, he may even dream again. A dream of friends reunited. Alright guys, if you dream at night, take naps, eat dessert, and don't live in Antarctica, then you too are a reincarnation of a god. Now get out there and start sucking some people! Oh, okay, that that was a joke. Don't do not do that unless there's some sort of consent going on. Uh, anyway, the Kirby community loves to throw around the term God and piggyback off of it. Because a God can be an exclusive, divine, supernatural, almighty being in video game media. Whether a character has a God status, a God reincarnation, or a God Slayer, that sort of title holds a lot of weight to it. When newcomers are looking into the Kirby franchise, about the simple cute puffball platforming in happy environments, and you have veterans telling them that Kirby is out there murdering gods every Friday night, or that he is one, of course the newcomers will gain some sort of interest. Eldritch Horror doesn't automatically equal god. You can argue some of these bosses have godlike powers, but are never stated as gods. This topic always gets amplified when making Smash Brothers tier lists about power levels, while also disregarding their viability in the Smash game because that's not what we're talking about. You'll notice people will put Kirby in the highest tiers, or even rank him number one because of his god-slaying body count, or that Mr. Pause Screen lore guy said one time that he has infinite power or something. So Kirby has to be the God Slayers or go above them. This would devolve into ultra nerdy discussions I would rather not get into. But the point I'm trying to make here is Kirby high on canon tier list means whatever is going on in his games must be going crazy. But because it's a tier list, you hopefully don't need to explain much and hope others take it all at face value. 
Oh, uh, guys, this is so weird. People don't believe me when I tell them how deep Kirby's lore is. That's, that's so strange. This so-called franchise of deep lore has no Kirby origin and no Meta Knight origins. Kin Dedede is a self-proclaimed kin of Dreamland, but is there royalty anywhere else? We don't even know much about Planet Popstar to begin with. I've seen multiple times of fans gushing about how fascinating Kirby's deep lore is with its mystery and emptiness. The only thing running deep here is the amount of loopholes Howl Labs created. Boy, Termina was purged of all negative emotions by Kirby and was possibly reborn as a new Kirby or Kirby-like creature. I don't know, please don't ask me about Void Termina, it's confusing and vague and it makes my head hurt. And I'm just waiting for a new game to hopefully clear all that up. Hopefully they address this and we get answers in the next game, they've already forgotten what they said last game and moved on it wasn't until those no clear timeline tweets that i noticed there's actually a lot of kirby law haters out there lol there's such a vocal minority of kirby law haters out there it's actually so funny lol you can say it's a vocal minority, and in fact, I would agree with you. I will say, the silent majority of Kirby fans and players don't care about the story and lore whatsoever. Kirby isn't a story-driven video game series. How Laboratory's priority is to pump out Kirby games. Story and lore are nothing more but afterthoughts to them. They cram story events at the end of the game, they hide paragraphs of applied scenarios and pause menus, they one and done a bunch of their characters that aren't these four, and someone probably got possessed along the way for the 80th time. The only other way to squeeze lore out of these guys is to ask them questions directly, and even then, they'll either beat around the bush or even backpedal on the answers they made. The loud Kirby fans who believe that HAL Labs is writing peak fiction need to get the dirt out of their eyes. Although there's a lot of fan reaching on lore connections in the franchise, I won't 100% blame them, because HAL Labs loves to egg on their audience that leave them out the dry. Plus a combination of very obscure information that a casual player won't see, these loud Kirby fans feel like it's their duty to be the lore Kirby police, to set things right. They're willing to dogpile outsiders, but will get overly defensive when any form of Kirby slander comes their way. Maybe you shouldn't be shooting cannonballs at others when you're taking shelter in a glass castle. I do believe there's some franchise insecurity at play, because Kirby can be seen as a game only for children, so the loud fans feel the need to gas up the more mature aspects of it. Kirby is for everyone. A vast majority of players will play Kirby games because they think the franchise is cute, or they enjoy the gameplay, and that's valid enough for reason to pick up and play. Kumazaki and friends over at HAL Laboratory should either go all in with their storytelling and commit the storylines or keep everything basic because right now their storytelling and laughably shallow lore is atrocious and that is aggravating. Oh uh, what else am I missing here? Um oh yeah also Wispy Woods bad. That's all I gotta say for right now so thank you all for watching and sayonara.